So I'm Matthew Borgetti. Uh, I do a, wear a bunch of different hats. Um, one of them is industrial designer, worked on a whole bunch of projects doing different kind of industrial materials design for places like Fusion Brands, which make a lot of silicone bakeware. I used to work in the special effects industry, which had me playing with a lot of animatronics and a lot of material science. And I recently started doing stuff with universities and robotics projects and thought that I could bring something interesting to the field of robotics, including opening the source and opening the methods on soft robotics completely pneumatic, or doesn't have to be pneumatic, but my designs are pneumatic, no hard parts required, cast silicone robots that are powered by air. Slide. So here's kind of the state of the art right now. Um, the White Sides Group has this thing that you might have seen before. It's a DARPA-funded project that is a little kind of walking crab starfish design. It's it, it, a cast silicone object with another silicone sheet adhered to the top of it that has a bunch of channels running through it that cause it to inflate. Um, and this is actually uh, another project from the White Sides Lab slapped on top of it. Um, that's a microfluidics project, so it's essentially a robot sandwich. And uh, uh, on the upper right, you have a robot from, I think, about 10 years ago. The Tufts ATL lab designed this uh, caterpillar. And the caterpillar is actually controlled by night and all wire. So there are hard, uh, incredibly hot wires inside of this. And the robot you see on the bottom is done by Festo Labs, um, which do does a lot of pretty and innovative robotics. But this thing is also controlled by a number of hard cables. These are, these are kind of inflexible skeletal elements that are at the core of a lot of these robots. And I think limit them in terms of their their softness, organicness, and mimicry of nature. Next. So what the heck is a soft robot good for? Um, this is a project from the Mediated uh, Matter Lab at MIT. Uh, these are printed uh, cuffs for alleviating carpal tunnel. Everybody's hands are a bit different. Everybody's carpal tunnel is a bit different. And a lot of the therapies for carpal tunnel involve limiting your axes of motion on the hand and also reducing the pressure to your wrists. But the idea is that with an individual person's flexibility, with an individual person's range of motion, their pain points, you can actually design something backwards from those specifications to design a brace that works for them. And the kind of things I'm thinking about is there are people who have strokes. They actually they have these assistive devices in therapy to get them, to encourage them to use the damaged arm. So oftentimes in a stroke, you'll have damage to a part of the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex, and you'll end up having somebody whose arm doesn't work the way they want it to. And one of the therapies for this is to actually attach robotic controls to their arm to give them that last little bit of oomph, because if they don't use the damaged limb, they actually don't regrow a pattern of neurons to move around the damaged areas. It can be done. Neuroplasticity lasts your whole life, but it takes very very, very diligent therapy. And I'm thinking, well, why not a soft wearable cuff that you could inflate to give that level of robotic control that you could wear under any clothing without motors, without batteries? So those are the kinds of things I'm thinking of. Next. So where the heck are the soft robots in the market? Why isn't there a soft robot you can buy? And my particular analysis on this, my take on this, is that the prototyping methods haven't gotten good enough that we can come up with reliable, cheap, iterative designs where we can start with some experiments in the lab and move on to something that eventually essentially predicts its own methods. In industrial design, you have this, where you 3D print your models, you 3D print your cell phones, and you test out the interface. You test little designs. You say, this isn't very good in my hand. This doesn't last very long if I drop it. And you can iteratively design that way. Soft robots in the lab right now are very, very time consuming and very, very expensive. And I'm trying to reduce that. Next. So I want to get, the, here are kind of my main points that I'm trying to solve with this project. I've got a lot of other things I'm trying to play with, but these are like the big brush strokes. I want to find a generalized method that with the same techniques you can make a whole lot of different robots. Um, I want to get arbitrary geometry inside a seamless skin. Essentially a seamless skin, no seams, no place for the human error to come into play and wreck things. I want to get arbitrary geometry as in if I need a robot that's like a tentacle and has a right hand curve somewhere in the middle of it, I can actually design the geometry inside of that around the needs, not have the limitations of the fabrication method limit the kinds of robots I can have. 
So I want the prototyping to be inexpensive. I want them quick and variable so that I can easily change different designs on the fly. And I want them easy to reproduce. I want that if I have a successful looking design, I can make a whole bunch of, to put, of them to put them through, through trials. Because a good robot stands up to a lot of environments. And this is one of my core beliefs at the bottom here. This is one of my core beliefs about um, universities. Uh, grad student labor is slave labor and cannot be reproduced in the market. If your thing takes 100 grad student hours to put together, it's probably not a marketable product. <laughs> Next. So here's what I'm doing. Um, I'm working with a company called Viridis that's doing my 3D printing. Viridis was founded by Jim Brett, who is one of the core founders of uh, Z Corp, which is a 3D powder printing company. And I'm here, what I'm doing is I'm making 3D powder printed molds um, that involve soluble cores. So the outside of the robot mold is made of plastic. The inside of the robot mold is made of wax or a soluble material like cornstarch. I'm using parametric CAD to do this so that I can change variables. When something doesn't work, I can roll back in the method and be like, this needs to be more densely filled, or the wall thickness needs to change. So I can quickly change my designs to fit my needs, and then I'm trying to have it be minimal, minimal manual fabrication. I have robots. I have robots that print things for me. Why would I design things that still take up my human time? I can have robots do that for me. Next. So. This is a functioning robotic tentacle. So what happens here is, yeah. So there's a structured hollow volume inside of here that as I pump it up, the volume deforms because of the air pressure. So there's a manifold right down the middle and one of these on either side. Bloop. This is a similar model, not hooked up to pneumatic control, but it's a trefoil, three of those volumes on the inside. It should be able to do a full 360. I just got this out of the mold right before CCC, so I haven't had a chance to test this one yet. But next, next, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry too. Um, next slide. So here's the method for the conical tentacle. So we start out with a hard printed outer mold. This is made out of a material called Maker Dust. This is a material engineered by Jim Brett um, for Veritas, um, but it prints out on a regular th uh, Z Corp printer. Um, additionally, uh, the Z Corp printer doesn't need any special adhesives or anything for this, and uh, Z Corps are powered by a standard HP inkjet head. Just in case you were wondering about how magical the uh, 3D printing is, they squirt liquid out of a inkjet head. That's, that's the magic. So next. So here's the core. Here's the uh, cornstarch core I was talking about, printed cornstarch. It's, it's not a terribly complicated material. Um, it is a little bit on the fragile end. It is a little bit on the brittle end. We've moved away from this particular method. It was really, really plausible because the idea was, well, all you have to do is soak the tentacle in water and eventually you have uh, working skin. That doesn't work so very well because you get to something um, I like to call the lumpy pancake problem which is you have uh, a little bit of the silicone soak into the cornstarch and it doesn't quite become silicone and it doesn't quite stay cornstarch. It becomes, like if you've ever had a lumpy pancake, you have like a layer of goo on the outside and then there's like a dry flour lump on the inside. That, that's what happens. Next one. So here is one, the core placed inside of the shell and silicone being cast in the seam between them. And that's as complicated as it gets. That's, that's just my, my time assembling this project was just waxing the two sides of the plastic mold and then putting in the core and the silicone. It's, it's a very, very rapid iteration process. Next slide. So here's a, that experiment working. Um, next slide. So what, what went wrong with that one? Well, um, so the, the materials design is actually really important with this. The kind of silicone that you choose is actually very important. I, I started out using a silicone that I just had on hand because I had it on hand. Um, I do a lot of um, prototyping for companies at, at my own company, Sleek and & Destroy. And I, I have a lot of silicones on hand. That's just part of, part of my gig. And so I, I used a cheap one uh, that's it doesn't have the kind of stretch, that doesn't kind of have the kind of elasticity that I needed. But there are solutions for this. The world is full of silicones. 
So um, I already talked about the lumpy pancake thing. The wall thickness, it's, it was important to come up with a method where I could guarantee that the cores I had lined up in the mold um, so that they wouldn't deviate and change the wall thickness because when you change the wall thickness on these robots, they actually change the way they move because the wall thickness is part of the pneumatic actuator. And adhesives were important. Um, I actually found a... Uh, thing called silpoxy that ended up working perfectly to seal um, silicone to silicone. Next. So yes, uh, we made some improvements, we made some changes. Uh, Moldmax and Dragonskin, those are the two silicones um, provided by SmoothOn, smooth-on.com, um, that work marvelously for this process. Um, next. Five minutes. Yay. So here is the new method, it is a wax core, next slide. So here's Jim Brett pouring up a, uh, a new tentacle. Next slide. And here's that coming out of the mold. So wax, the, the wax is easy to produce. It's easy to find. It's easy to manufacture little flat waxes um, because we're using 3D printed molding. And so all, all that happens is we cast the silicone in and melt the wax out. Next slide. Okay, more complicated things. This thing right here. So more complicated stuff. This. Yeah. So what do we got? is an outer mold here that's actually three copies of the exact same part and then the inner core is made ugh, almost lost it made with this flat mold these things although it looks kind of complicated these things are really easy to produce because if i design the tentacle that i want i can roll back the method and print on the 3d printer all the stuff to make it too this is a mold to create the cores next could i have the next slide so that's a 3D printed mold that makes this thing. Next slide. So it makes this. Next slide. I cast wax in it. Next slide. And it gets me a core. Next slide. I assemble that. Next slide. With a little jig that I, I made laser cut. Next slide. And I put it in the mold. All of this stuff I can make easy multiples of. So if I want to have 100 tentacles casting at the same time, say I need 100 legs for something, it's actually really easy for me to just go along the line and pour into all of these molds and have the printer printing more as I'm doing it. Next slide. And so that's what comes out. Next slide. So there's the bottom. You can see the trefoil shape and the little shadows of the way it was cast. Next slide. So what's next? Next slide. Well, I've got a quadruped that's coming out that should be done by the end of January. It should walk with only two airlines, as in one airline causes it to do a left-hand walk and one does a right-hand walk, essentially how a gecko walks up the walls, touching each side of its feet together. So you have left side walk, right side walk. Next slide. So. I need your help to push it further, because I do the mechanical engineering, I do the industrial design, but I think to make it truly open source, because the idea is to get other people doing this, not to just be like, I have a lab and 3D printers, everybody look at me. The, the whole point is actually to create a better ecosystem for soft robots, because I think they're a really cool technology that needs to be pushed further, and one person in a lab probably isn't going to do it. It's going to be a lot of people playing with a lot of experiments. So I need to bring it to a prototyping level where you don't have to have my specific experience in CAD to use my files and learn from my designs. You know, I've been using like SolidWorks for 10 years. I know SolidWorks pretty well. I shouldn't say, here, use my files. But first, go to design school, drop out of design school, go back to design school, then start working for a special effects industry. That, that shouldn't be the limitation here. So fast iteration speed, and I need a computational solution. Next slide. Um, I think that, that you need that to keep this source open. I can give you my STLs, you can print those on your own, you, you can print my 3D files, but that's kind of limited. I would rather, I, I mean, I'm going to give out my 3D files. I have a profile on Thingiverse. My username is Giant I. Um, I need to document all the things I've been putting up on it, but there are Thingiverse files. Um, Keeping it open is more having you be able to replicate my success, not replicate my specific results. Next slide. OpenSCAD is not an option. So if you, if you do an image search on OpenSCAD, people have been suggesting OpenSCAD. Um, it doesn't have the kind of robust parametric control that I think I need. I think I need, next slide. Uh, libraries and processing, the, like the work of Nervous System and Marius Watts, they have been able to use One computational, minute. thank you. They've been use, able to use computational design to develop growth patterns that fit certain constraints. And I think that a hollow tentacle 
populated by a growth pattern that fits certain constraints is perfect. I think you, what you would end up looking for is like bone ingrafation. Um, ingrafation? I mean, there's a name for it. The patterns inside of bones or the patterns inside of corals, those are algorithmic based growth patterns. The cells individually are seconds. doing... Yes, next. So, I'm not alone in this process. I'd like to thank Jim Brett and Veritas3D for helping me out with the engineering and partially funding this project, and Amanda Wozniak for offering amazing advice. So, next, I'm Matthew Bugatti. My site is Harms, and my Twitter handle is GiantEye. Look at my site for all the source and the methods on the robots, and thank you very much.